Hey everyone, how's it going? Hope wherever you are, you're happy and healthy and working hard towards attaining whatever it is that you desire. Welcome to another episode of Bitopia University's Discussions. In today's episode, I hope to touch on a few topics. One is crypto ethics and launching a project that adheres to the principles of this space. So making sure things are transparent, accessible, inclusive, accountable, and also launching things in a fair way. And I will go over some examples, uh, both from many years ago and more recently to give you an overview on how things were done and how things should be done. And uh, apart from that, I will also go over some aspects of uh, including people in your project and giving the public a window of transparency and to, uh, on how you make decisions and uh, the overall governance aspects of your organization. If you want to access our website, you go on to bitopia.org. There you can subscribe to keep, in, you know, keep informed with our progress and updated with our progress. Bitopia is the world's first decentralized autonomous university. It has taken me about seven or eight years to put together these pieces and they all include uh, you know, various parts from various projects and the experiences that have led me to believe the design behind it uh, should be done in the way that it has been done. And I'm very excited to share parts of this throughout the videos. Uh, though if you don't have a background in cryptocurrencies, decentralized systems, uh, it will take some time for you to fully grasp it. So that's why we, you know, these videos are important and the discussions that go around, uh, the topics that are involved within the videos. Bitopia.org is where you can subscribe. You can also pre-enroll. And uh, just to make sure you understand, Bitopia isn't about teaching just blockchain or decentralized systems or cryptocurrencies. If you have a course that benefits people, that contributes towards self-actualization, uh, I would love to hear from you. And if you have, you know, following if you have things that are important that you want to teach please reach out if you're a student that wants to explore some of the courses or participate in learning or contribute or collaborate please reach out also so as a student you can go to pre-enroll and uh, indicate your interest you can also follow us on social media channels which are listed at the bottom of the website facebook twitter youtube and telegram telegram is a open source alternative uh, to regular messaging applications such as WhatsApp or uh, Facebook Messenger. And uh, it has a lot better privacy features and security features when compared to WhatsApp. And it's open source, uh, which is great. So people can review the code if they want to. They can also make modified versions of it. And Telegram does have many, many different uh, uh, versions of it, uh, of the platform for various needs that have been done by people in various countries. And that's one of the benefits. So similar to Linux, that you have many different distributions of Linux. Uh, because the code is open source, it means that anyone can change it, anyone can modify the code and make it, you know, uh, uh, customize it to what they need and uh, contribute and make it better over time. That's where you can access our website, bitopia.org, and uh, the Telegram channel links to our campus room. Though we have many other different uh, rooms where you can participate in conversations. You can read them uh, via campus.bitopia.org. You can also join it in the same way. This works on a platform called Rocket Chat. Rocket Chat is an open source alternative to Slack, where Slack you would pay for you know, per member. Uh, if you host Rocket Chat and, uh, on your own server, you don't need to do that. And it's open source and I find it a lot easier to use than Slack. And obviously my data isn't hosted with Slack um, in an unencrypted manner. 
uh, which has its own kind of ramification. So we've hosted it ourselves, and you can go and read the conversations. You can also enter the campus channel via our Telegram channel. So if you go to Telegram, it's Bitopia underscore U, and uh, that will give you access to campus. All the other channels, you will need to go to campus.bitopia.org. The platform itself, Rocket Chat, the open source alternative to Slack. Uh, there's a mobile version of the app itself. And once you open it, it will ask you for a server address and you would put campus.bitopia.org. That's our organization. That's how you can participate in conversations, reach out to us whether you want to contribute, collaborate, study, teach, wherever else it may be. And those are the channels that we use. Moving on from that, uh, Bitopia is a decentralized autonomous university, uh, which is similar to that of decentralized autonomous organizations. And to understand this requires some background. And these are the things that we will cover in our courses that go over decentralized autonomous organizations, decentralized systems, and how they operate, the benefits of it, et cetera, et cetera. So if you want to learn more about this, apply to study with us and uh, you will learn how to use this. It doesn't apply just to future organizations. You can turn any organization. In fact, you would be much better off turning your ordinary organizations into a decentralized organization because it increases transparency, it increases accountability. It allows anyone in the world to see what you're up to, how your decisions are being made, how your funds are being spent. You just don't have these kind of uh, functions within normal organizations, at least to this level, or unless you are an investor and you go in and like get the involved with the lawyers and all that. But as the average person, if I was sending money to a charity organization, I don't really have a way of tracing what happened to that money, where it goes, and how the organization is spending their money, how they're making decisions. I don't have this. So if you come from a corporate or legacy background and you've, you know, this is your first time you're hearing about this, I think you will be quite excited, depending on your state of mind, on the, the advantages of a decentralized organization. Aragon is a platform that lets you create decentralized autonomous organizations. Uh, that's what they had intended to do since their uh, launch. I think they have done a great job. I mean, if you go back about a year or two, it was very hard to create these types of organizations and to make it user-friendly and sustainable and error-free. Though we have reached a point in time where it is now very easy to create such organizations using platforms like Aragon. There are others as well, like DowStack and a few others. Aragon for me has always been my favorite because it's clean, it's smooth, they have a great community, they have a great support system and the interface is uh, very user friendly. So if you wanna create your own, you can go to mainnet.aragon.org. If you wanna learn more about it, reach out, we can walk you through it. And that's another part of our services. Uh, if you wanna create an organization, if you want to uh, create a uh, business around it, you, how do you do the tokens, how do you create a community, the ethical aspects of it, the cultural aspects of it, etc., And that would be done through creating an organization. You can also p test around with uh, creating one so you don't have to actually use Ethereum uh, because you do have to pay about $5 up to $20 depending on how you structure your organization to create it in the form of Ethereum, uh, which is a decentralized uh, token system. Uh, you can also do it on the test network and just play around with it that way. And uh, again, these are things that we will cover as a part of our uh, university course where we will get you to create your own organization. We will discuss governance. We will discuss uh, supply of tokens and how that would work within your organization, distribution, uh, management, security, etc. In our case, uh, we already have an existing organization on Aragon, uh, the Bitopia Foundation, which is the framework and the uh, governing body of Bitopia itself. It is where decisions are made. Anyone with access to the internet can come and see our governance structure and uh, how much power each member has, depending on how much they have contributed to the project. Eventually, these will uh, distribute a lot more as more people come on board, 
and more people contribute. The, to begin with, uh, this is the model, the number of people on each, uh, the power each member has, the kind of decisions that are being made. So for example, we changed our support to 60%. So if someone has 55% of the governance uh, power, they can't make a decision by themselves. So there's a lot of work behind making sure things are fair, things are transparent, and that uh, people are account accountable for their actions and participation. And also to set up the framework of Utopia in a way that is derived from a great amount of experience over the years on how the projects have done uh, their, well, have designed their framework. You can also go there to see our finances so you can see money coming in and how it's being spent and where it's going and the description for each uh, transfer. These are very, very important things. So you don't have these kind of tools for your traditional organizations. So if you're familiar with QuickBooks or MYOB, depending on what country you're in or your basic accounting and uh, software, it's online, yes, but it's only accessible by staff members or particularly your accountant. Decentralized organizations have this window of transparency for anyone to look at. Uh, it changes the entire paradigm. So it means that if money is coming in, you know where it's going, you know how it's being spent, and you know what kind of decisions the organization is making. And uh, I think once people understand these tools and the impact they can have, it will be very exciting. And the, number of projects that are using these sort of frameworks are increasing day by day because people understand the benefit of this and you know the reduction of uh, headquarters and paperwork and management and all these things uh, you know just simplifying it to a decentralized autonomous organization in the same manner i can put projects automate the reward so it takes that part of the token um, just to explain, this is for our governance body. It's separate to Bitopia's actual token, which will be used to reward students, teachers, contributors, collaborators, etc. Uh, so you can already take part of those tokens and put them here as jobs and put rewards up, put projects up. So anyone in the world can contribute to your projects and it's all automated. Uh, there's no need for like, Yes, yeah, send me an invoice. It, I'll get the accountant to transfer the money. Oh, where is it? Oh, yeah, we do our payments on Wednesdays. Like, once you deal with decentralized organizations in this space, you understand how slow the old model is and how outdated it is. Uh, it would be equivalent of comparing, you know, riding a horse to flying. You just can't compare. It's completely different, uh, and it's. One of the many goals of Bitopia is to give people the power through education and knowledge. It's not that people don't want better things, it's that they don't know. So a person might want to change their diet, uh, they just don't know how. They, you know, they, they get stuck and when you get stuck it's much easier to fo follow the herd mentality uh, because it's the safe option. So if you give people the, the information and the knowledge that they need to make a change in their life, whether it's you know, their organization, their daily life through the habits of lifestyle, you know, what they eat, what they drink, etc., you give them the tool to empower themselves and then they can make better decisions. This is a huge part of Bitopia to open up the veins of knowledge in the world and allow it to, uh, to be accessible by anyone in the world and that anyone can contribute to it. Uh, so not just Professor X from, you know, uh, Ivy League school says this, it's like a uh, hundred professors around the world have contributed to this course, you know, and that's a much better model because then you're tapping into the wisdom of the crowd and you can look into the uh, aspects of what wisdom of the crowd is in your own time. So it has a much better accuracy when compared to one or two experts and uh, there's been a lot of experiments that have been done around that part. So if you b allow information to be readily accessible and uh, you allow people to challenge certain parts of the information or the course, or if they don't agree with it, they can take it and like modify it and customize it based on what they think in the same manner that open source systems work, I believe we will have a very different world. And Bitopia is leading uh, the path into a world where 
education and knowledge is open and anyone that's looking to host a course on Bitopia uh, should understand the importance of having that knowledge that they're you know, passing on to a student be open for anyone to see. Because not only does it mean that people can see it, uh, it also means that someone can challenge your course and be like, hey, this part of your course, perhaps uh, you know, th this information should be changed because as of you know, last week, there's a new experiment that showed that it's now like this. And that makes your course better. It makes your course uh, be up to date uh, rather than you know, the traditional education system which you may go through and by the time you finish that the information is already obsolete. So imagine having software updates where it's like, oh, there's a new patch. Imagine doing that for education. You get an email, hey, you studied this course, there's a new uh, update, uh, watch this video to get you up to date with uh, what you have studied. This is a small part of what Bitopia is. Um, there's a lot more to it and over, the, over time I will explain more and more of it. Our organization is a DAO and the Decentralized Autonomous University expands on that. So the foundation is very important and how you set your foundation determines how you move forward. And I'm gonna use some examples to show you uh, implementations that I believe could have been done better and ones that have been done in a way that I can say, uh, like my hat's off to you, uh, great job. To begin with, I'm gonna return to Bitcoin because we should start at the beginning. And crypto ethics, will this, you know, we will go into this at a much more intense level and much more thorough. The Bitcoin was launched and its max supply was set at 21 million. So maybe you already know this, this is easy stuff. If you don't, Bitcoin is a digital, uh, decentralized digital currency, crypto, uh, cryptocurrency. And when it was launched, it was designed to reach 21 million. This is very important because if you, tr if you were to compare this with the traditional fiat currencies, like the US dollar, Australian dollar, Canadian dollar, euros, uh, you don't have that uh, max supply. So the supply increases over time, which means if you had a dollar, let's say 50 years ago, you could buy a lot of things with it, whereas that dollar today, you, you know, ma significant difference in what you could purchase. The purchasing value of that dollar changes because more money has been printed, devaluing the dollar and other things involved. With Bitcoin, it's the reverse. So what you have then is a system that uh, the supply doesn't change, uh, the production, of, I mean the circling supply changes, but the max supply doesn't change. So miners uh, produce more coins in a simple way and uh, until we reach or get close to 21 million. Which means if you had a Bitcoin 10 years ago, uh, today it would be worth a lot more. Uh, you know, obviously, depending on when you come in and when you get out, you can have an impact on uh, how much it was worth and how much you sold it for. Uh, though I'm not going to get into that. This isn't about the financial aspect. It's just simply to explain how the supply works and why Bitcoin goes up in value uh, if you were to look at it as the you know, greater aspect of the time. Bitcoin was launched in a way that uh, was fair. So you may see this in different uh, aspects of the decentralized environment where they will come up with things like pre-mine or no pre-mine, fair launch. These are terms that may get used. And again, we'll go into this in the course. In a simple way, it means that prior to the coin launching, they had made an announcement. The code was released that people all had the same uh, advantage uh, in mining it. It means that there was no surprise. You know, Satoshi Nakamoto, he, she, it, whatever it was, didn't start mining Bitcoin and then announced, hey, Bitcoin's ready to be mined, go for it. Meaning that that person had uh, an advantage over everyone else because they started mining it. And how mining works, if you were to compare it, so again, breaking that in a very easy way, Mining works in a way where it gets more difficult the more people try to get it. So at the start, yes, you could have started with a laptop and mined Bitcoin. And then maybe a graphics card, as more people came in, the difficulty goes up, right? And eventually the ASIC miners bought it up. 
and the difficulty went up too much for you to even be able to do it by yourself with your laptop or graphics card. Then you needed these huge warehouses. Um, if you were to compare this with gold, imagine the more people tried to mine gold, it, you know, the earth just knew and made gold more scarce. And that's the model behind it. So it means if you came in at the start, you could mine a lot. And if you didn't tell people or announce it properly and started mining it yourself, it's what's called an insta mine because it's so easy to mine that you, you know, there's two or three people just trying to mine it that you would get a lot out of it. This didn't happen with Bitcoin. You can look into this and you will see this. A coin that was a part of a great number of uh, discussions and debates was Dash. It's called Dash now. Dash started as X coins, then it became Dark coin, and then it became Dash. So if you want to learn about the particular history of it and how it progressed, you need to know those names because the Google search for Dash alone isn't going to find you the answers. So if you look into X coin or if you look into Dark coin and then you know what became Dash, you will see certain things come up. The story, depending on who you ask, uh, will have a different perspective. Some people will say, yeah, it was Instamine, but over time that got distributed, so it's okay because those people who first minded, you know, would, and they have huge uh, sums of it, no longer do, and it gets justified uh, through that reasoning. Now, whether you want to follow that reasoning or not, whether, you know, it's okay that it wasn't fairly launched because later it was distributed is okay. Those are, those are things that you need to consider. And as a part of our course, we will ask you these things and get your perspective on it. And it's important on how they could have done it differently. And uh, we'll go down those paths. This is an article that I will, you know, the link will be uh, submitted to the panel, uh, description panel of this video. So it's a person going over it in a very uh, informative, an objective manner. So within the very first hour, 500,000 coins of, uh, back then it was called uh, X coin, were mined. Over the, within eight hours, 1.5 million coins were mined. And they refer to it as Insta mine. And then the, the issue with the software. So if you have an issue with the software, it means that those who face the issue are not able to mine. So when you release the coin back in 2014, 13, 15, uh, you would release the Linux wallet and the Windows wallet, or at least uh, the source so people can compile it. Without the wallets, you can't mine the coin. Uh, especially in the case of Xcoin, it was the first coin to have you know, all these uh, different algorithms put together. So it wasn't as though the pools where people go to mine as a group uh, could configure their system to be able to mine uh, X coin. So this caused some issues. It meant a huge number of coins were mined because other people didn't have the same, you know, benefits of knowing which how to how to how to debug the issue, or how to uh, mine the coin. And the, the announcement was made, you know, in the late hours within the United States and the early hours within Europe, as the text goes to say, meaning that it was done. In a kind of a sneaky way, the announcement wasn't done properly. They didn't announce, let's say, a week in advance, hey, we're going to launch Xcoin in a week's time. Be ready to mine it. Here's the software. Be, you know, we're going to launch. Uh, well, at least not the software, because once you have the software, you can mine for it. But have the software ready as soon as you launch to, so that the public can grab it and start mining it um, and put everyone on the same level, rather than, you know, you have the software and... Uh, you have a running machine ready to mine it and everyone else is trying to figure out what's going on. That's, that's not the correct way to do it. Quick examples on how that was done in terms of Bitcoin and Dash. And uh, we can also look at more modern examples. Telegram was able to raise $1.7 billion in its uh, ICO. ICO is a crowd sale, initial coin offering, and you, you, know, you can use different names but they all refer to the function of requesting the public to send you uh, money and in return you give them uh, cryptocurrency. So in the case of Telegram, they hadn't uh, released their coin yet. They raised the money and then you would get compensated for that in their own token 
uh, which was planned to be done by April 30th, 2020, uh, so yesterday. And uh, or two days ago, maybe. And uh, the SEC went after them. They said, well, how have you spent the 1.7 billion? So if you have a DAO, you don't need to answer these questions. And uh, perhaps the, 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 the function of these technologies were not up to the level that you know, allowed it to be run in a user-friendly way when Telegram raised this money. Or perhaps they didn't think about it. Maybe they came from a corporate background. They didn't fully understand decentralized technologies. Though, nevertheless, the issue here is that you have taken public money and uh, there's no way for people to, to, in a transparent way, see how that's been spent or been allocated. Fast forward to 15 hours ago, this article came out. So it is the 1st of May today in Australia and it's 12 p.m. And they missed their 30th, April 30th deadline to launch the Telegram token to give the investors, you know, the token that they had uh, contributed to. And as a part of the terms and conditions, uh, if they didn't launch by April 30th, investors would get 72% uh, refund. That means 72 cents for every dollar they had put in, which isn't very good, especially if you have, you know, if you had put a million dollars in, uh, you get $720,000. It's not uh, $280,000 in difference is not okay. Though that is the case, and people don't know better, so they can't demand that Telegram has a different way of functioning. If this was done as a DAO, the money would go into the DAO, decisions would be made on how it would be allocated and spent, and automatically you would get your token. There wouldn't need to be this much effort in uh, trying to resolve the situation. Furthermore, you don't request that much money. Requesting that much money prior to the project being launched See, back in 2013, 14, 15, a lot of these cryptocurrencies, uh, they did it through mining. So if anyone asked for money, you were, uh, you, you were literally questioned as to why you need the money because they, they said, you're a developer, why don't you just develop it, get it going, and then request help that way. Though as more executive people came into the space and, and, the, and the culture kind of changed towards more fi financially uh, focused people, it was suddenly okay to ask for 10 million, 20 million, 200 million without even having a workable model. And that is not okay. Uh, you don't do that. So at the least, every project should have a proof of concept prior to asking for money. Uh, they should have some form of a framework or something to show uh, prior to asking for it. Yes, Telegram already had you know, millions of users, hundreds of millions of users, though that's already functioning and then if you're asking for that much money on the side for your craft sale you need to show what it's being used for and have some sort of a even more of a reason why you should have developed some sort of a application prior to asking for it so you don't get the gold medal before you run the race uh, you don't do that so a lot of projects you will see raise 10 20 million without even explaining what it's being used for a lot of them they don't even need that much money to build their project and you can see it up to billions of dollars and it's not the way to do things. So as an investor, I uh, would recommend that you look into these things and what is the organization using the money for? And if you're going into it because everyone else is going to, then that's your own discussion to be had. That's one way of doing it, that Telegram did it and it requires a lot of oversight, SEC can come up after you, etc. Internet of Coins is an organization within the Netherlands. I've known these guys since 2014. And uh, they're a lot more focused on transparency and accountability. So when they raised, I think they raised over a million dollars. And uh, even though they raised over a million dollars and they could have just taken that and distributed however they want, they passed that money to a nonprofit organization which is NLNet Foundation. NLNet Foundation had, does a lot of jobs. With, I mean, is involved with a lot of uh, applications in the privacy security sector within the Netherlands. And they are an amazing organization. You can look them up. And uh, what they have pretty much done, Internet of Coins, is say, we'll give you all the money that we have raised, and you give it back to us depending on how we ask for it. So 
That's next level. That is beautiful way to launch a project. Internet of Coins is a non-profit organization and a part of a registered NGO, NLNet Foundation, which controls our expenditure to make sure the donations are spent responsibly. With this organization structure, we aim to continue the project for as long as possible. Furthermore, the code to make this platform possible will be open source and accessible for everyone. Now, if you have a gold standard on how you should launch, this is, this is a great example. Though 99% of organizations would never do this. Um, and that is why I love that they have done this. They didn't need to, but they've done it to increase accountability transparency. That means they understand the space they're in and the principles that come with it, uh, which I had mentioned in the last video that this space comes with certain principles. This is a part of that to be responsible for the money that has come to you, to show that you mean it by you know, implementing something like this and uh, that the code and, you know, is open source and accessible for everyone. Now that's great to see, that is really great to see. And uh, you, know, you don't need to do this anymore because you have DAO uh, structures and for the time that they did this, this was probably the most state of the art uh, in terms of being responsible and transparent. So my hat's off to them for uh, the way that they did it. And you compare that to a giant like Telegram, they were not very responsible. And you can see how cryptocurrencies function differently on different countries and the culture that comes with it. And uh, I have noticed within the Netherlands, transparency and accountability are very high up. Um, and I really enjoy working with organizations in, uh, in, in that region. And I'd like to take that and uh, teach it to other people so they can learn from it and the importance of it. Even Aragon itself, uh, you know, and the way it functions uh, through giving people a window into how the money that they, were, that they raised is being used. So they have a transparency model, you can read about it. Again, I will put these in the links within the description panel. And you can see the, the amount of effort they have put towards making sure their investors know how the money is being used in the community and the, you know, anyone that's a part of it can see it. And uh, their meetings all reported, they have a transparency of funds, quarterly reports, where they explain all of this. So if you do this, you will no longer have people questioning how you have spent your money. If anything, they will praise you for the level of transparency that you have brought. This transparency model of Aragon, again, is something to celebrate and something to understand and is a part of this space. So Internet of Coins, Aragon, Bitcoin, great job in uh, representing those principles and what makes a project powerful and uh, sustainable and the roots so deep that it becomes anti-fragile rather than fragile. So anti-fragility is the concept that the more you try to break it, the stronger it becomes. A traditional organization is not like that. Uh, whereas these decentralized organizations, if done correctly, are very much like that. And uh, yeah, those are some examples from that side. Lastly, I just want to touch on a video that I've been getting, you know, as a part of Bitopia, I'm looking for uh, Sources of knowledge that can help uh, expand self-actualization. And, uh, you know, when you're on the path of seeking the truth, you'll come across a lot of different things that really blow you away. And you're like, why haven't I not known this all my life? One of those things for me in recent times, well, obviously, cryptocurrency is decentralized systems uh, back in 2013. And uh, as of recent, permaculture. And permaculture has really redefined what it means to be sustainable in my mind. You know, I had a great opportunity to visit a location within Valle de Bravo in uh, Mexico, uh, Mexico, and uh, it really, it really uh, had a huge impact on me because to see how food is grown in a sustainable way and permaculture techniques. If you watch this video, I highly recommend it. Again, the link will be shared. And uh, Jeff Lawton goes to a desert within Jordan, I believe. Yeah. So he went to a you know, desert-like terrain within Jordan where the soil is absolutely infertile. And he, despite, you know, all the people in that area who have lived there for 
generations laughing at him was able to use permaculture techniques and ideologies and methodologies to grow trees and harvest fruit you know, by building these swales which captures water, redistributes it using certain plants to slow down the distribution of water, bring life back to the soil, regenerate the earth. So not only are you uh, benefiting from having those plants there, but you're also regenerating the entire area. And that for me was just mind blowing that this person could do this, you know, grow fruit like fig trees uh, in the middle of the desert and do it in a way that's just spectacular. And as he says, like, if I can do it here, you can turn anything into a forest. You can change the whole biodiversity of the earth. And, uh, you know, you can give food and grow food in uh, places where it's just not thought about because we always think, oh, we have to send them food because they can't produce it themselves uh, because they live in areas which they can't have such trees or supplies. So he really goes against that. And there's other videos on him talking about it and how he has done this. And as he said, with this, you can transform the whole world with such simple things. And uh, these are the kind of things we hope to teach people about Bitopia and uh, help people break through these barriers, you know. As a friend of mine said, uh, who I met in uh, Oaxaca in Mexico, he said, he called it the invisible walls. So these invisible walls that, like, we, you know, we create and we're just like, no, I can't get through this with, like, we have created them, whether through education it's been passed down to us or misunderstanding of certain fields and topics. Whatever it is, we need to remove them. And by, by giving people um, the correct uh, paths in being able to obtain educational knowledge, um, these walls can hopefully be brought down and so people can keep, keep moving forward and uh, level up, you know, and remove their dependencies on... Uh, on uh, so many things. So with permaculture, you you know you don't need fertilizers. You don't need to like devastate the land, put chemicals. You know, like it's just done so in such a different way. And there's a lot of videos out there, and like, a lot of teachers. And I met a teacher in uh, San Cristobal in Mexico again. And hopefully, I will have him uh, teach in both English and Spanish uh, permaculture courses, as well as other things. And uh, I was very inspired by these things. So. That's it for today's episode, and uh, I hope you learned a bit about how our organization works and that we don't do lump sum payments, uh, for example, for our advisors or other people wanting to be involved. Uh, it's based on the contribution that you do. So you'll see a lot of projects that uh, you know, give advisors lump sums or other people that are involved lump sums and because they bring their name to the project and hype it up. Um, this is all very short-lived. And you will see most projects that have done this, uh, they're not sustainable, they don't grow, they, 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 it's about making the money and then disappearing or letting it die out. And um, as a person that's been involved in this field for a long time, that is not my intention. Um, it's poor design, it's poor engineering, and uh, a system can be designed in a much better way. Thanks for listening. Uh, take care, have a great weekend. And I'll catch you on the next episode. And if you have any questions, send it through and we'll discuss them in our next talk. Cheers. Take care.